Hello, this is Graham Brown, Principal with NextGen Advisors. Welcome to our podcast series. I'm joined today by my colleagues, Dr. Marty Lustick and Dr. Betty Rabinowitz. In today's podcast, we're going to discuss a policy paper published recently by the American College of Physicians, written by Matthew Camp, who's both a physician and PhD, and Lois Snyder Somasi, JD. The authors undertake a deep exploration on the ethical and professional implications of physician employment and healthcare business practices. The paper focuses on the intersection of ethical principles and professional values about the patient-physician relationship, the primacy of patient welfare over self-interest. The authors also evaluate the impact of incentives in the shift to value-based care, physician contract clauses, private equity ownership, clinical priority setting, and physician leadership, amongst other thorny issues. Overall, it's a wonderfully written piece, though we probably won't have time to discuss all of it today. So let's start actually with the shift to value-based care. Marty, do you agree with the concerns that the authors raise about pay-for-performance programs, that they may result in inappropriately influencing patient or physician choice? or fail to account for complex medical illness, or fail to demonstrate appropriate respect for the autonomy, and therefore create barriers of access for disadvantaged patient groups? Well, the short answer to your question, Graham, is yes. But I I think the more important issue here is that, in my mind, no matter what financial framework you put around the practice of medicine, you create a series of ethical challenges Uh, that it's important then to have policies and procedures in place to guard against. So, you know, if you take the opposite extreme of a pure fee-for-service world where you're essentially uh, financially incenting physicians to do more, there's the ethical question of are they doing things that don't need to be done that are potentially putting patients at harm. And so in a pay-for-performance program where you're potentially incenting them to do less or to do specific things as a priority, you create a different set of challenges. And I think it's just really important that you have an approach to managing that that guards against inappropriate behaviors. One of the other areas they address is referral-based incentives, which are used commonly by health systems, academic medical centers, and other hospital groups. Those potentially present another potential conflict in balancing professional ethics. Betty, I'd be interested to hear your thoughts on this and whether the recommendations that the authors make to physicians are appropriate or sufficient. This is a very thorny subject. I struggled with it uh, both as a practicing physician and physician leader. Clearly, there are advantages to a narrow network. There are quality improvement opportunities in a narrow network. There are relationships and communication channels that are open in narrower networks that allow better patient care. So there is a rationalization and a justification for creating these networks. Where it becomes problematic is where there's an expectation for physicians to make referrals into those networks against their better judgment about the appropriate provider for less expensive or higher quality care. And there, there is that tension continuously. And those physicians who walk this line successfully were the ones who maintained their judgment and applied judgment to where each referral was going, adhering to the recommendation of in-network referrals where appropriate, but uh, maintaining independence and uh, sending patients where they felt it was clinically or uh, otherwise beneficial to the patient. So it's a fine line that physicians are expected to walk. I thought the ACP recommendations were somewhat vague. I don't think they really helped much. I think they they helped outline the problem very well. I'm not sure the solution was very clear. 
Yeah, a comment on that. In my own experience, when I was in uh, practicing in a globally capitated environment, one of the ways we tried to guard against this risk, because we were a closed delivery system where, you know, you had to jump through hoops to refer somebody outside of the system when sometimes that was clearly where the best provider was. And we had the system set up so that if you were the doctor seeing the patient, so when I was seeing a patient of mine that I wanted to refer, I was in the patient advocate role and there would be another physician on call for referral management who I would have to have the conversation with to convince them that the patient needed to see uh, a different specialist. The next day, that dynamic might be flipped where that doctor was seeing their patient and wanted to refer them, and I was on utilization call. So we, we set that up purposefully so that the doctor taking care of the patient could always function in the advocacy role. Interesting. Did you find that it worked overall for the providers to play this dual role and recognize that their colleagues might come to them tomorrow with the same request? I'm, you know, any system you have is imperfect, but I think it was a lot better, you know, than trying to be put the responsibility for managing utilization and being a credible advocate for your patient in somebody's head at the same time. It's a very difficult tightrope to walk. So um, a couple of the other kind of thorny ethical issues that these authors uh, bring bring to bear in the article really relates to how physicians are employed and the language of their contract agreements with whomever their employer is that speak to things like in-network referrals, as we were just discussing, no outside activities where uh, doctors can't do anything outside of their kind of clinical role with their employer uh, in any kind of public way. Restrictive covenants and non-competes, wherein if they leave that employment situation, they're limited in some way as to whether they can practice with whom they can practice or geographically where they can practice. Just be interested, you know, both of you have been employed in many different areas over the years in your professional careers. How common have these um, types of clauses been in your experience and are they subject to negotiation if you've come across them? Clearly, this language and these issues still show up quite a bit in physician contracts. There is no uh, question. There's the clarion cry usually around the non-compete that it's not enforceable in many states. And my experience in the larger employers is that many of these contractual uh, elements are not negotiable, but larger, more um, enlightened employers, for example, apply these rules only to the early parts of uh, physician employment where they clearly have made a significant investment in recruiting these physicians, setting them up in practice, and are trying to protect themselves from physicians who will start incur all of these costs and leave very quickly. But as you mature in the organization, these clauses grand, uh, kind of fade out and are not uh, uh, impactful. My experience is that it's probably not worth a lot of legal fees and power negotiations around these things in large organizations. They rarely will agree to uh, remove them. I think negotiating them with a time lapse is probably the the most important um, and understanding that actually many of them don't have legal teeth and would be very difficult uh, to reinforce. Yeah, I, I agree with what Betty said. I, I would frame it myself as, you know, these are more theoretical concerns than real concerns because in reality, most of the time these issues get worked out on the back end, even if the uh, they look difficult on the front end. So I, again, just wouldn't bother uh, putting a lot of money into legal fees. 
So let's build on that topic because one of the other areas that they raise as a, as a potential concern doesn't seem particularly common to me, at least in its application, which is around termination clauses and physicians being abruptly terminated from their clinical position and appointment. You don't hear a lot about that happening and occurring. And yet when it does occur, perhaps there are, you know, clear reasons for it. But they're talking about no no cause terminations. And be interested to, you know, that they're making recommendation that be two way. So physicians can also just leave the role without cause and or their employer could remove them from that role without cause. But they also speak to your point, Betty, that that be for a limited period of time, that it's early in the physician's hiring or employment role, that that's applicable and that it uh, either go away over time or it only be applicable for the first contact year. This approach seem reasonable and, and how common how common is this problem? Again, my uh, experience with large employers is that, and certainly in certain states which are at will employment states, that it applies as well to physician employment, that, that it's a clause that's familiar to me. And it's usually uh, one can uh, ask for it to be bilateral, even though that sometimes contradicts with clo- other clauses in the contract that require physicians to give up to six months notice before they leave. And I must say from a patient advocacy perspective, it seems completely reasonable to me that physicians need to give uh, longer than average uh, notice because of the upheaval and difficulty that patients have when physicians do leave practice. Yeah, I think along those lines, both the employer and the employed physician have a responsibility to the patients in terms of continuity and not abandoning uh, patients. So for me, terminations, it, it, you know, during the first year, I can understand why you could have termination without cause. But beyond that, if there's a termination without a period of time for transition of the patients, it should be for cause in my mind. Another area that they raise relates to private equity acquisition of physician practices. And this has certainly been picking up over the last five years. We've seen a lot of investment by private equity companies into particular specialties. They are concerned that this actually may pick up in the aftermath of COVID, that uh, for the past year and things have been perhaps um, on a bit of a standstill with regard to major acquisitions in this regard. Do you think this pickup is likely in the aftermath of COVID? Do you think that uh, in in the coming year, we're going to see more of this acquisition by private equity partners? Marty? Yes, I do, for two reasons. One is, if you look, I think, over the last year, one of the lessons learned for physician practices will be that those that were part of a larger organization that were owned were able to weather the financial storm uh, much better. And we even heard stories of not just on the financial side, but also being able to get PPE early in the pandemic um, and have the other types of support to manage their patients. And the other piece I think that will contribute is that from the investor's perspective, it's likely that they will be able to buy practices at a lower cost than they were before the pandemic because of the fear that um, practices have based on the last year. Betty, what are your thoughts on this? I agree uh, with Marty. And even though we're not kind of delving into the ethical implications of that financial model, I would just point out to our listeners that it's worth giving a little bit of extra thought to the, the ethical issues in that model because they're somewhat accentuated further by the short-term kind of involvement that these uh, groups often have in their clear for-profit uh, obligations to their participants and investors. It's a very interesting area. So the final subject that they address is around the influence of regulations and these kind of external factors, payer reporting requirements, payer contract obligations, various different quality measures and performance measures that are being tracked in practices and how those are influencing clinical priorities and physicians' time. 
you know, we certainly hear a lot when we talk with providers around the country around the administrative burden of trying to support these different regulatory requirements. So what what resonated with you, Betty, about their assessment of this subject and whether, again, uh, how you think those challenges were addressed in your own practice? I, I think this is a very important issue. Think, for example, of a pair contract in which certain quality measures need to be tracked for which a practice puts in place enhanced services for patients or enhanced tracking or enhanced interventions. What happens if they apply these interventions only to those patients who they're contractually obligated to and not to the rest of their patients? So there is immediately an opportunity to not apply the same standard of care to all of your patients based on contractual or regulatory uh, differences between patients. And that is very troubling to me. We, I know, always required that any enhanced services or interventions that were applied to some patients be applied to all of the patients. And that population health tools that we were using allowed us to measure and apply to all patients because requesting physicians to monitor what type of insurance a patient has and based on that decide on the kind of care they will render is really very, very uncomfortable. It happens a lot, though. So uh, this, is the, this is the sharp edge of the double-edged sword of value-based initiatives and programs when they are not applied equally or there is not funding, for example, for care management for all patients. Only one insurer will support or subsidize care management. Physicians are caught in very uncomfortable uh, positions. And uh, I would make very strong recommendations that uh, patients are not segregated based on their on their benefits at the physician level to provide attention or monitoring for quality or quality interventions. Uh, Marty, you've kind of been on the other side of this potentially in your prior roles. Is you know when you were working with a health plan, how did you work to ensure that physicians wouldn't be subject to additional burden when considering how programs were going to be measured? And I'd love to hear your thoughts around uh, the comment Betty just made on care management programs. Those are a great example of where they're prioritized by certain payers for certain populations, and yet the practice then has to discern who is that eight percent of my population that re- that's uh, supposed to benefit from this care, and uh, and not serve the other ninety two percent the same way right so it it, i think betty hit the nail on the head Uh, honestly when i was involved in this on the health plan side in our early arrangements and betty's aware of this we actually tried to make the cohort for quality metrics the entire patient population not just those patients who were covered by by our health plan the problem with that is that the health plan, as Betty pointed out, is not going to pay for resources to extend programs to patients that they don't cover. So even if you put those metrics in, then you sort of create the unfair situation where you're providing support for a portion of those patients to get the outreach that's needed. Um, and then the rest are left up to the practice to figure out. And so then ultimately the practice feels like they're being incented to do something, but they're not given the resources to do it. And so there is a bit of a setup for failure. I think it's a really difficult but very important issue that we haven't solved. Ultimately, it may take some sort of regulatory environment where metrics are common across payers uh, as a way to mitigate some of that. But it is it is an ongoing challenge that's in real life today. Interesting. Well, thank you both for sharing your experience and perspective on this. It was an interesting article and touched on a lot, as we noted, of uh, this fine line between ethics and professional behavior and decisions that providers need to make on a day-to-day basis on how to best navigate these uh, thorny issues. So thank you, Dr. Betty Rubinowitz and Dr. Marty Lustig for your thoughts today and also to our listeners for joining us. Consider subscribing to our podcast. Just hit the button. You know where it is. This is Graham Brown with NextGen Healthcare. Thanks for listening and have a great day.